Well, this is at the Barton Rock. We've come down the Leavens from Loch Lomond and we've stopped here for a break while Anne's munching away something tasty. And from there we'll be heading down into the Clyde to catch the tide. They'll take us down into the, the Firth and out onto the west coast. Here's our campsite opposite the Barton Rock. It was rather rough and windy. This is a submarine just off the north of Arden that had appeared on trials because it's very deep off this part of the coast of Arden, one of the deepest parts in the Firth of Clyde. And I was quite glad I was no closer. I didn't fancy a submarine coming up underneath me. <laughs> This is our campsite at Tavert in Loch Fyne. Uh, it's a major fishing port and harbour for yachts, for sailing and racing. And from there we ported across onto the West Loch and out onto the, the West Coast. It's only a short portage, it's only about three to four miles, so it's quite a simple portage. And that would take us on to the West Loch. This is one of the yachts of the harbour at Tarbert. This is one of my friends, Jolly, who's got a converted fishing boat here and a catamaran. He's polishing or sanding down the dagger board. That's his catamaran. That's the great thing, that can shift. I had a shot in this catamaran, you know, and it's fantastic. A typical scene, that's Jolly's converted fishing boat. There's a lovely cold stove inside this thing, you know, it was like an oven inside in a cold night. Marvellous. So as you can see, Tarbot's a busy, busy place. And this is the start of the trip onto the west coast of Jura. And it was one of the largest parties. There was a four doubles, five doubles and two singles, making it about 12 altogether. And that's Sandy Lyons, who's a, got a haulage contracting business, and he supplied the, the, the transport free of charge. Great chap. He's a member of the Scottish Horses Canoe Club. And here we are, got the canoes getting loaded, <laughs> carried into the water. We carry them in empty, of course. We, very, we treated the canoes very carefully because they were either canvas or PVC. Tough, but we looked after them. If you looked after the canoe, you, they looked after you. And that's Joe with the waterproof bags that were used for carrying your spare clothing, sleeping bags, etc. It was essential that they kept they were kept dry. And this is our campsite at the head of West Loch Tarbert. And here again we've got good roomy tents. And a mountain of gears. Amazing what they can carry the canoes. Spare clothing, sleeping bags, tents and enough food to last them for about two weeks, if need be. Here's again, it's a trolley, a stout trolley in the stern there because we're heading up onto the west coast and then we'll be crossing over to Jura and portaging from there across onto the west loch in Jura. Normally the trolleys are, are collapsed and stowed in under the stern but because we're having an immediate portage we've just left them up strapped onto the, the, the deck.
And here we are landing on the east side of Jura. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is actually the campsite of the, the head of Westlock Tarbert. Can you just get it hauled up? Yeah, that's the campsite at the the head of the, the Westlock. Fly sheet going on the tent. Fly sheet is quite essential because it takes the worst of the rain off the tent. So if you don't have a fly sheet and you're sitting inside the tent and you touch the, the wall the inside of the tent, the rain can come through, starts dripping through. So a good fly sheet is, is uh, quite handy. And this is typical of the amount of gear that we carry stored inside these canoes. A good spray deck, and they wouldn't have uh, wetsuits in those days, so a stout uh, PVC jacket was very good shelter from stormy weather. It would uh, zip clip over your the spray deck, and even though the, the the waves were maybe coming over the top of the canoe, very little water got in inside the canoe like that. Very effective. <clears throat> this is heading up the west coast of uh, up to what's called Berry. This is a slight wave, no problem here. The canoes can handle that all right. And of course, if the weather gets rougher too, each paddle stroke can be a support stroke as well. You altered the feather of the blade so it was flatter in the water and acted as a support in case of a capsize. But in all these trips I've been on, there was never a capsize as such. We always took care that the weather was canoeable without the danger of a capsize. If the weather was too bad, say a lot worse than that, would stay put or head for the nearest shelter. The weather is a key factor in all these trips. If it was good, we moved, we paddled. If it was bad, we stayed put. Always allowed for maybe two or three days for bad weather. Joe coming in. That's Jura out beyond. And here we are, we're on the east coast of Jura now. And we're preparing for this portage across into West Loch, Jura. The West Loch in Jura nearly cuts it in two, and this is about two thirds of the way up the, the coast, the east coast of Jura, and we're portaging across. Some decide to carry the gear over first, <laughs> stuck a gear, and uh, then the crews were taken over on the trolleys. Positioning the canoes on the trolleys was quite important to get the balance right.
because it wasn't a, a surface road, it was a rather rough track. And this is uh, an empty cottage on in the West Loch in Jura. At that time, Jura was, half of it was owned by the Astors, and this is one of their holiday houses. It was quite funny, inside the house there was a, the key was under a slate at the side of the door and it was sparsely furnished but the, the centrepiece inside the house was a lovely big brass double bed and there was a huge fight as to who was going to sleep in this bed, you see? So we decided to be diplomatic that nobody would sleep in the bloody bed. So we camped outside. <laughs> that was quite funny. And this is heading out the West Loch in Jura. A paradise for wildlife, seals and otters and deer. And that's Collinsey out beyond, about eight miles out beyond. You can, so you can see that acts as a barrier for the westerlies. The seal's been very inquisitive to follow you for miles. And once you get into a steady rhythm like paddling, you could paddle for miles without really getting tired. And here we are on the west coast of Jura with the big fire looking out to Colonsey and tons of firewood. This is at Sheehan Bay, a marvellous campsite. Logs. And we'd have a smaller fire for cooking on. And there's a lovely wee burn come, well, it was the size of a river, down uh, to the campsite and out onto Sheehan Bay. In this case it wasn't ant, it was ticks and amongst the bracket. So this is Bob getting the ticks removed. <laughs> One way is to bum about the cigarette end. <laughs> Rather painful but it works. And this is a pool that was big enough for a swim and a wash in Sheen Bay, a paradise. And here we are across at Scalseg and Collinsey and John McConville pouring a wee dram and he liked his dram. And that's Jura in the background. Collinsey is another marvellous wee island with lovely campsites and a sandy bay. And we landed here at the village McBrain's steamer has just left. And another lovely sunset from Collinsey, looking back across to Jura and the Corrie Vrecken, the north end of Jura. Beautiful. And this yacht was moored out in the bay at Scalseg and this damsel appeared in nothing but her nightgown early one morning. <laughs> this is our campsite just round from Scalseg at Queen's Bay as it's called. Enjoying the sun. Here we are loading up to, to leave. There was an early morning start at 6 in the morning because we had to get the tide right 
to go through the Corrie of Reckon. It was most important that we got there almost at slack water as such. Because to try and get in through the Corrie of Reckon against the tides can be too dangerous. So it's essential that we get there when there's almost no tide flowing at all. So the very early start. And this is us heading across to the north end of Jura and the Corrie of Reckon. Again, the weather conditions are quite reasonable, nothing to worry about here. The canoes can cope with this no problem at all. It's a nice steady paddling rhythm would take us across. And this is the entrance to Jura, the Corrie of Reckon. And we got there just in time because it wasn't the flood tide that was going to cause the problem, it was the ebb coming in from the west. It created a huge wall of standing water when we, once we look back. We just get in in time into one of the, uh, the lovely uh, sheltered bay at the north end of Jura, which we could camp in. This is heading into this sheltered bay because the tide was just beginning to turn behind us and with the ebb tide there's no shelter at all, there's no slack water at all, it's just a wall of standing waves right across from north to south. <laughs> Here we are coming into the safety out of the tide race. So that was the end of another very successful trip to Jura. And this is back at a clubhouse in Loch Lomond at Auchendenen, loading up for a typical weekend on the loch. The canoe's getting loaded up with all the gear. These canoes were more or less built at home, canvas canoes costing about 14 to 20 pounds and looking on to Loch Lomond. Sleeping bag and spare clothing wrapped up in canvas bags. I'd empty the canoes are easily carried down over the wall and we've now got a gate in the wall that makes it easier to go over into the loch. Loch Lomond was a training ground for all these trips on the west coast because Loch Lomond can be nice and calm but it can be very rough indeed. In fact, sometimes I would say it can be worse than the sea because in a strong wind you get four or five waves to the, the one, say, in the sea, the water being lighter. You get a steep pitching wave. So it provides very good training for the canoeing. So the canoes have been carried down and now we carry down the gear. 
and set off for a typical weekend in Loch Lomond. We try and pick a, a, a weekend where there's good weather forecast. And this is on one of the islands, Inchlunig, looking across towards Lus. And a lovely morning, all lying out getting the sun. We even carried a portable gramophone. <laughs> And there's Lila Wheel beds, so with all the home comforts. And this is us playing about with the sails. These were small masts we got in the ex army stores that were used in RAF, the rubber dinghies, uh, if they were ditched at all. A small telescopic mast, but ideal for the canoes that could be used with a falling wind and even if the wind was coming on a quarter astern provided extra uh, or an umbrella was another way of using <coughs> An umbrella was a very handy thing too if you were in the, the tent and it was cold and wet to see if you get all the gear on you just go out with the umbrella and squat under the umbrella and this is the yew trees Inchlonig is famous for the yew trees that are dotted on the island they were planted there way back by Bruce seemingly so it's the story goes and there's always a campfire smoky yes but essential that provided cooking in the centre for the crowd to gather around and cook and yarn and talk about things. And this is up at Drower Denon, one of the canoe courses I was on, I had taken. This is two young girls that were on the course, on a collapse of old, old Grant a double. They were very popular at that time. All the canoe courses were pretty well booked up for several years. So we introduced a lot of young canoeists into canoeing at that particular time. And as you can see the lock can provide quite a sizable wave. Well this is another trip that started from Glen Finnan and Loch Shiel down into Loch Shiel and this is the burial a ground of one of the clans the McFarlands and the McNeils, I'm not sure which and this small island, the burial island in Loch Shiel and Loch Shiel would take us down to Acharachal and from there we'd portage down the river and then out onto Egg and Rum I can't mind the name of the island, but you could check it out on the map.
is us having a, a drum up. We ate well, the Dixies, beans and soup. More soup. And here we are, we're going down the river, Arichel, down into Loch Moidert. Loch Moidert is a gem of a place, wonderful secluded island on the west coast. Well worth a visit. No problems here in the rivers, it's quite uh, smooth flowing. It's not until you get down towards the, where the river comes out into Moidert that we have a, depending on the state of the tide, there's quite a drop down into Moidert itself. That's Chillum Castle we can see in the background there. And the river's beginning to get faster. And here we are going down the, the rapids, that's myself and the double, down into Moyers. It's one of the few occasions we wore life jackets, so. <laughs> just in case. John McConville here, he nearly goes over, but he manages to stay upright. He just makes it. <laughs> That was John who came this and killed it with me, with Anne. Great guy. And this is us heading from the Moid out onto Egg, the School of Egg, another wonderful island dominated by the spectacular the landmark of the School of Egg on the left there. You want to be break? You alright? You okay? Ah, fine. Uh, Carry on. Yeah. Ah, it's In fine. the floor, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah. That's about eight miles out to Egg, and the weather is quite reasonable. Always make sure a crossing of over four miles that the weather is good, because to paddle eight miles if there's a wet, strong headwind can double that almost to four or ten miles or another four or ten miles you've got to paddle. We're heading onto the bay on the east coast of Egg. Egg is quite rocky and cliff bound on the east side, but it's a wonderful sandy bay, the singing sands of egg over on the west. And this is us rounding the coast of Egg, which as I say pretty well surrounded by cliff, and then we come round into this wonderful spectacular scenic view of the singing sands and egg looking on to rum, across the rum. So once we find a good campsite and a nice island to explore, we there's a 
bit of surf coming in here. So we've got the canoes and we're, this is Ronnie, and a Gantuck canoe. It's one of the best designed canoes that Joe Reed ever designed and built, a Gantuck. A terrific canoe, a terrific sea canoe. A final edition of the Clyde. Lovely canoe to look at and very manoeuvrable and very seaworthy and plenty of room for gear. On a previous occasion on a visit to this island with my friend the Alec Davison, the waves were about three times the size of this, so you could quite a surf coming in. And Alec coming in, he capsized actually, but came to no, tr no trouble. Just got a bit wet. So I decided to have a shot myself, strip off of, and get into the, the Gantuck. I'd never paddled the Gantuck before, but discovered it was a marvellous a, a boat. Get the spray deck fastened. And coming in with the surf in the campsite on Sheehan on a Egg. Lovely place. Well, it was a, vi a visit. This is us now on, we're on Rum. We cross from Egg onto Rum, which is only about three or four miles. And there's no sandy bays on Rum as such. It's pretty mountainous and cliff bound. And of course it's famous for, it's a deer sanctuary. And the deer are very tame, they come right down into the tent looking for tidbits. And we're now making our way across onto the west, uh, west side of Rum. Well, there's the one sandy bay. It's a rough track across the other side, sand. And there's nothing here at all until you come across this amazing site of this mausoleum. It was built by the Bulloch family who owned the island at that particular time. And they're entombed in this fantastic place on the west coast of Rum. Amazing. I mean, there's nothing else but this, you know. Quite amazing. Gone to a lot of trouble. Back to our campsite. And we're getting the gear packed up for quite a long uh, haul this time, we're heading from Rum back across to Murar, which is quite a long stretch, about 12 miles or so. All the gear getting packed up. This is us leaving Rum now, we're heading away across to the mainland, to Murar. This was quite a long day, but the weather wasn't too bad. Again, it's important that a long stretch like this, that the weather is canoeable. because it's wide open on all sides by this time. You're right in the middle 
surrounded by the giant islands of Sky and Rum and the mainland. That's the point of Sleet. Looking back towards Rum. And looking back onto the school of egg and the lovely sands of Morar Bay. We were glad to get here. The next day was beautiful and we have this lovely stretch of golden sand at Morar where we made our final camp at the end of the trip. So the nice semi-circular trip, we started off at Morar to the south, out onto Egg, and then on to Rum, and then back into Morar. It was a very popular trip. And back at the campsite at Morar, as we yak away about this and that, and so on and so forth. Most enjoyable. Nobody's the worst aware, and we all had a, another very enjoyable two weeks trip on the west coast. No trouble with the canoes, no injuries with ourselves. Back safe and sound, and transported back on the roof of various cars back home. Well, this is the start of the St Kilda trip at uh, La Colche. We're camped here at Broadford on Sky. That's Anne. And John McConville, who was with us in the single, a PBK-15, had joined us for this trip out to St Kilda. John hadn't done that much canoeing, but a very strong, fit chap. And this is on the island of Scalpe, where we had landed at the bottom of the sound of a uh, Lassie. And this is heading out from the north of Sky, we headed up uh, the sound of Rassi to the north of Sky. And this is us heading out towards uh, the, the US, North US. Well, it was good. Forecast had to be good because we had a 25 mile crossing here or thereabouts. So the weather had to be favourable. And as you can see, although it was 25 miles, you can see the low-lying outline of the U.S. In the, in the distance. So it gave me the overconfident outlook that I would pick up St Kilda eventually. Because it was sticking out almost 2,000 feet high out to the west of the U.S. And this is in the sound between North U.S. and North US and South US. What's that called again? Sound of. I don't know if I can mean. And into the sound of Harris. The weather was good. 
nice sandy bays. No problem here, but once we're rounded into the shelter of the Sound of Harris, now onto the actual west coast of the US, a different ball game. The seas were huge, gigantic swell coming in from the west. It was a different game altogether. This is heading in towards Hugari, the small village that we eventually left to get out to St Kilda. And here we are out to St Kilda. John had turned back after about two or three miles out. The weather had proved too much for him and his single was getting tossed about like a cork. So he turned back. But Anne and I plodded on and eventually we got round into Village Bay. Which Christine and your friend were glad to see. Dolina, yes. This is our campsite. This is us heading in. We had actually landed in Borrowry first, not knowing which was which. We actually canoed round Borrowry looking for Village Bay, but it was all cliff. So we just lay, hove to the sheltered part of Borrowry, and eventually about two in the morning the, the mist had cleared and we headed into St Kilda itself. Looking back onto the stacks of Borre in the distance. That was the island that we hit first. And the first sign that the land was there were the seabirds coming out, flying out from th through the mist. So that we couldn't see the actual islands, but the, we knew there was something that lay ahead because of the, the birds were flying out and flying back. There must be something there. Thank goodness. We had a marvellous time on St Kilda. The army base had a base there and they treated us with VIP treatment. And this is us going back in the puffer to, from Loch Marie. They transported after a week on St Kilda be, the army officer there said that if we tried to canoe back, it would cost us £5,000 or so to launch a lifeboat if anything happened. So they, tried, they got us back in a big landing craft to Loch Maddy on North Eust, and with the price of a half bottle of whiskey we got a lift from Loch Maddy back to Oban. This is another two week trip. We're on the steamer out to Barra on the Hebrides and we're going to explore the island south of Barra. That's the Clyde double been lifted onto the pier. And a Clyde single. Two doubles, that's Kishmule's Castle. Two doubles and two singles in this trip. Kishmule's Castle on Barra, which has now been re roofed. And heading down to Vattersea, the Sandy Bay in Vattersea, that's the first of the islands south of Barra, which is now connected by a causeway across from Barra to Vattersea itself. Archie and the uh, uh, Clyde with his box of goodies in the stern. <clears throat> it wasn't a long trip as such from Barra down to Mingale and Barra Head. It's only about 12 15 miles, but it was a, mile, a trip of exploration more than anything else. 
Unfortunately, the weather was kind to us. So this is the next island, uh, south of Vatase, the island of Pabe, another lovely island with uh, nobody on this island, with Sandy Bay and Archie doing his gymnastics. They're all pretty strong swimmers, which is handy. usual beach combing. There's always plenty of these glass floats, fishing floats and all sorts of stuff washed up in these parts. And this barrel providing some sport. And this is down onto Mingale, which is the main part of the trip. The huge bay on the east coast of Mingale which was once inhabited, same as St Kilda. And this is a campsite up amongst the remains of the village, looking onto the, the beach at Mingale. Mingale is like a, a miniature St Kilda. It rises from the bay, facing southeast again, up onto the huge cliffs on the east side of the, the west side of the island. This is the west side of Mingale. Of course, these cliffs are filled with hundreds of seabirds, guillemots, puffins, etc. Fumars. And it's this part of the coast that eventually we're going to canoe up round up towards the north. And this is down between the south coast of Mingale and Barra Head, where the lighthouse is up beyond. That's the, that's the map showing us from Castle Bay down on to Battersea, Babi, Sandy, and down on to the large island of Mingale. This is on the west coast of Mingale. And we're just having a wee trip down to Barrahead. Uh, and you get a tremendous feeling of exposure here because there's nothing but several thousand miles of Atlantic Sea out beyond. And God knows what it must be like in the southwest westerly. And once we're rounded, we headed up in between the gap between the two islands there, the rocket islands, and there's a huge swell coming in and the canoes were rising and falling and disappearing from view as we went through this gap. And this is now back up on uh, Castle Bay and, and Barra. So here we are up at the north end of Barra the cockle stands for the aeroplane comes in to land. It's more or less the end of the trip. It had been a very pleasant trip of exploration. Lovely sandy bays on the west coast of Barra.
and from there we got the steamer bike home. Again, it was a very pleasant trip, no problems. And this is another trip to Staffa. We started off from Oban, out along the Ross of Mull, out to Iona, and out on to Staffa. Six of us, six singles. Into the famous Fingal's Cave. And from there we're now on to the Treshnish Islands, which is a bird sanctuary, the island of Lunga. This is us back more or less at Oban, after another successful trip out to Staffa and Round Mull. Oh, wow. 